Okay, hello and welcome everyone. So in this video, I'm gonna do the Corno Oligopoly lecture. Now I've got a series of Corno Oligopoly worked ex examples and I'll link those up in the description and those would be good to follow up to what I'm doing here. Now in, in this video, I'm just gonna be sort of like the, what, the, what the main lecture would have been like. Uh, okay, so the starting point is in 1838, Augustin Corneau published the first truly mathematically rigorous work in microeconomics, right? So this is sort of like people have been thinking about economics and economic concepts for a really long time. And the first maybe rigorously mathematical work goes traces back to Corneau. Uh, it's available actually as a free Google ebook, though probably considerably more uh, legible if you know French. And so uh, I was able to find that for us right here. Here is Corneau's book. You could scroll through it and yeah, indeed, this sure is, uh, sure is in French. Also, the mathematics, like usually you might think, okay, well, I don't speak French, but I do speak math, kind of. Well, the mathematics here, as you look through Corneau's book, is actually gonna be considerably different from what I'll develop. And kind of the main reason for that is actually the version of Corneau that we think of is actually going to be attributed to Joseph Bertrand, who was writing in not 1838, but 1883. And so the Bertrand oligopoly model is kind of the price choosing counterpart to Corneau's model where firms are going to be choosing or individuals are choosing quantities to, ma to maximize profits. And for a given example, one or the other might be better suited. Uh, interestingly, thinking back to like the history of what Corneau was writing on, if I, if I recall the story correctly, it had to do with studying mineral water producers. And the story I always tell in class, which if it's not true, it's super helpful for the understanding at least, has to do with mineral water producers. And think about it. Think about like mineral water. Back in 1838, if you want to bring mineral water to a village and then sell it, you're making a quantity decision. You are choosing how many jugs of mineral water to fill. You might go up a mountain or down a trail or path or whatever it is. Like there's some effort involved. There's some decision you kind of make in the morning or the night before in terms of like how many you're going to fill and then bring to the village. Water to the village that's going to end up determining whether the quantity demanded is is matched by the quantity supplied or or, or vice versa. Uh, if the quantity supplied is large relative to the quantity demanded, we'd have a surplus. We'd expect price is going to fall. If we have a quantity supplied as small relative to the quantity demanded, we'd have a shortage and expect price is going to rise. Well, anyway, so individuals, individual mineral water producers are making a choice in terms of what quantity to bring to the market. And the important thing here, important part of the story is realizing that my choice is interdependent with yours. So for both mineral water producers and you bring a certain quantity to the market, then no matter how much I how much I bring, I'm lowering the price relative to what would happen if I allowed you to be a monopoly and vice versa. So the idea is this important interdependency and that's captured by the way that we think about and the way that we model the demand curve. So in the Corno model, firms do more than just pick an output. They are picking an output in response to the choice made by the rival, right? Thinking about how many jugs of mineral water is part of my choice in terms of how many to bring to the village. The rest of my choice has to do with like, well, how many are you bringing? And then what's this going to what's this going to do to uh, to influence the price overall? All right. So for a market served by two firms, we write out the market demand like this price is equal to a minus BQ1 minus DQ2. This looks horrible. I know it does. Like the first time you look at it, it looks absolutely horrible. It's not though. Let's kind of look, walk through it slowly. This is inverse demand. So here's price and then here's quantity, right? And what this is doing is we've only ever seen price is equal to like 10 minus Q or something like that. That's just like this, but this is the, the numerical counterpart would be price is equal to 10 minus Q1 minus Q2, for instance. All right, so what's this A, what's this B, what's this D doing? Well, the A would be our vertical intercept for our inverse demand. The B and the D are gonna be, well, slopes. And the fact that we might allow them to differ would correspond to, well, the different contribution that each would end up making to, uh, to how much the market is gonna bear. So if we have some degree of product differentiation, then maybe, bring another unit of good from uh, seller one 
does something different to the price than does another unit from from seller two, for instance. And so that's kind of the that's kind of the important idea. I'll build up that intuition as we go along. I feel like Matt Foley there for a second. Uh, but what we're going to do for the for the beginning part is we're going to think about the simplest version of the market where price is equal to or where B is equal to D is equal to uh, is equal to one. And if you didn't catch that reference, go to YouTube. Well, you're on YouTube and type in uh, Chris Farley, Matt Foley. All right. Anyway, so clearly A has got to be bigger than B times uh, Q1 plus uh, D Q2. Otherwise, the price is zero, right? A has to be larger than what's being deducted from it. Otherwise, the price is zero. We're assuming the price can't be negative. So in some sense, what this is doing is this is showing how much the market overall is going to be able to support, right? And so the idea is, well, um, there's a limit to the amount of whatever is this quantity. Assume, let's just assume the products are identical. Assume B is equal to D is equal to 1. There's still a limit to the total amount of Q of of uh, to the total quantity that the market will bear, and it could be exhausted either by how much firm one is bringing or how much firm two is bringing. Okay, so anyway, what's going to happen is the firms are going to compete to determine how's the market going to be served, by one, by the other, symmetrically, jointly, however, and kind of furthering my intuition about this interdependency. If A is equal to BQ one, definitely firm two better not produce anything. Why? Well, if A is equal to BQ1, price is already zero. And if Q is positive, then the price would be negative, which isn't going to happen, but it is going to tell us that consumers aren't going to buy anything. And vice versa, A is equal to uh, DQ2, right? Then uh, firm one better not bring anything because the price is already zero. So what's going to happen? There is this key feature, this key interdependency between what the firms are doing. Ultimately, what we're assuming is that the firms are doing this simultaneously. So initially, the way that I'm telling my mineral water story is we, you know, we are making our decisions simultaneously in the sense of not having observed what the rival has done, but we know something about like their habits or their, their trends. Over time, there's this type of Corneau dynamics built into the model. And so, uh, and so that's kind of really important here. Uh, the other thing, though, is we could allow for observing what the rival has brought into the market, and we could allow this, we call that like sequential timing. And matter of fact, that gives us a different type of oligopoly, Stackelberg. And so I've got a video for an example on Stackelberg oligopoly. And I think actually the way that I build up that, uh, that, that example comes out of Corneau and would be a pretty low cost entry point into the Stackelberg model, though I'll, I'll probably do a separate lecture for Stackelberg. Anyway, so we won't formally model the process of convergence to equilibrium. We'll just assume that we're in the standard Corneau, that we're choosing at the same time, and then we know that the equilibrium is going to be reached. And I won't do kind of the convergent story. That actually brings us into like PhD level micro, so we won't, we won't worry about that. Okay, so here's my general case. I'm going to talk about the general theory first, and then there's a numerical example of this. But I want to talk about the structure of the problem because that's actually super important to your intuition for how Corneau works, especially relative to how some of the other things we'll study work. All right, so here's our Corneau duopoly with identical firms. I'm going to have constant marginal cost equal to C, and here's my market demand, which we said before. All right, so we're actually going to invoke a little bit of game theory. I've got a separate lecture. I'll talk about game theory in the intermediate micro course a little bit later on, but this is kind of our first low cost pass at it. So in order to stipulate a game, we need players. So our players are firm one and firm two. We need strategies. Each firm is choosing quantities. I, if I'm firm one, I choose my quantity. If you're firm two, you choose your quantity. And so we have players choosing quantities, and then we have payoffs. And our payoffs are just our profits pi one or pi i for firm i and for, or for one, one and firm two. All right, so we have players, strategies, and payoffs, which is all we need to be able to stipulate a game. And so the next thing what I want to do is actually depart from what looks like game theory for a second. Turns out, in what I describe next, this is actually going to be a normal form game. And for those of you who have studied game theory before, you're like, wait a second, I thought normal form games involve matrices. Well, they can. You can also have a, a normal or strategic form game that looks just like this, right? Ma a matrix game is a special case of a of a normal or an extensive or a, a, sorry normal or a um, strategic form game. Extensive form game would be modeled using a game tree. 
All right, so I'm gonna write down the profit functions. And the other thing that this links up to is actually as we're staring at this, the more natural context thinking out of thinking out of intermediate micro is that this is actually just profit as we've seen before, right? This is price times quantity, which means this is revenue. And then this is just costs. Well, how does a monopoly and how does any firm decide how to maximize profit? Well, it's gonna maximize where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So indeed, we're gonna take a derivative, we're gonna get marginal revenue set that equal to marginal cost. The only difference is that our marginal revenue for firm one in Corneau is gonna involve firm two's choice. And our marginal revenue for firm two in Corneau is gonna involve firm one's choice, which means ultimately we're gonna get a system of equations and we'll have to solve. Two equations, two unknowns. It's not that bad. Okay, so the second, set, uh, second step is to solve each firm's maximization problem separately. So we're gonna maximize profits and so what I'm gonna do here is I just rewrote the profit function. We're gonna take a derivative ultimately. So what I, what I do here, I'm actually glad I did this. I did the algebra to distribute this Q1 to everything. And I'm gonna take the derivative of this thing. I'm gonna get A minus two B Q1 minus D Q2 minus C is equal to zero. And then once we have the first order condition, we must solve for the choice variable of each firm. I'm just gonna solve for Q1. If I solve for Q1, I'm gonna get something of this form. Matter of fact, like this is the general form, like every Corneau problem that you solve, it's gonna look kind of like this, right? You're gonna have, you're gonna solve for Q1 and then you're gonna have the firm, you're gonna have some weighted version of the firm, of the other rival firm's decision. It's weighted here by D, which might be one. You ha you're gonna have the uh, vertical intercept of the inverse demand curve. You're gonna have marginal cost, and then you're gonna divide by two in, for a standard Corneau where, or for the for the special case of Corneau where B and D are both equal to one, this is just gonna be A minus C minus Q2 over two is equal to Q1. Anyway, this is firm one's reaction curve. This is giving us firm one's optimal choice as a function of Q2. Oftentimes I'm gonna write this as Q1 of Q2 because this is a function of Q2. Now firm one and firm two are gonna have are both gonna have reaction curves. So now we gotta find firm two's reaction curve. And I just switched to the next slide, doesn't look like it. It's cause all I did is I just flipped the numbers, right? So now I'm solving firm two's maximization problem. And the only difference here is that now firm two's reaction curve is gonna have BQ1 divided by 2D, right? So it was for firm one's reaction, it was DQ2 divided by 2B. For firm two's reaction, it's uh, BQ1 divided by uh, 2D, right? That's coming from the inverse demand. Now, in, a, in, a, in the special case, again, if B and D were both equal to one, these things would look the same. All right, so this is firm two's reaction to firm one's optimal quantity. So now we've got a system of equations, two equations in two unknowns. That's these right here. We'll solve by substitution. That's always the way that you're going to solve. And the one thing, the kind of the thing I I want to kind of mention, although I, I don't know that I did it here. No, I didn't do it here. One thing that I want to mention is that if it turns out that your a minus c is even, you're gonna wanna, or, or divisible by 2b for instance, or 2d, you're actually gonna wanna simplify. You're not gonna wanna write this as, as a big fraction. You'd actually want to simplify this out and write this as, if a, if a minus c was even, you just wanna do this, you wanna separate these out and do that division. I'll, I'll model that a little bit later on. The reason why is it just kinda simplifies down the algebra. But what I've done here is the is kinda probably what mo most people would do. So. What I've done is I've substituted one reaction curve into the other's reaction, and now it's just a matter of algebra to solve. All right, so here I just replaced, you know, I just started with this step, and now this is just a whole bunch of algebra. And what this does is, like, the first thing is I'm gonna multiply through by 2b, right? Move this to the other side. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna cancel this, cancel my d, and then ultimately I'm gonna multiply everything through by two. And then I get what? 2a minus 2c and then I this stuff and then 4bq1. As you're doing one of these and then notice then as, as I simplify this down, I end up getting a minus c is equal to 3bq1. And then finally a minus c over three is equal to q1. As you're doing a Corno uh, solution like this, look what happens to the right hand side. You're gonna go from like one to two to four to three to one, right? And if you're doing your Corneau and you end up going up to five here, you've done something wrong. Or if you get like, a, if you get something other than two, four, you know, three, then you're, you've done something wrong. And then for a general Corneau, 
this is exactly what our Cornell solution is going to be. This is actually my optimal quantity. That's why I put a star there. It's going to be a minus c over 3b. And for instance, if my inverse demand were just a minus q1 minus q2, if b and d were both 1, then my optimal solution would just be a minus c over 3. Right? And that's actually kind of nice to kind of keep in mind because you can, you can then foreshadow uh, the solution to a given problem pretty quickly. All right, so now here I'm solving for firm two's optimal choice. Now, I wouldn't have needed to do this if I, if I trusted my reaction curve. I could just take a minus c divided by 3b, and I could plug that in here. I could just plug in the optimal that I already found. But I'm going to resolve the system of equations. And so now this is just solving for firm two's reaction. Sometimes that's good to do just as a, as a, as a safety check. And uh, it'll, it'll help you determine, uh, you know, if they, if they come out, if, if you have a symmetric Cournot, meaning B and D are the same, and they both have the same marginal cost, and you get different quantities, now you've got a problem, and you'd catch it having done this. All right, so anyway, so now we've got firm two's optimal choice. It's going to be A minus C over 3D is firm two's choice, so we have an equilibrium. Our equilibrium meaning, uh, we have an equilibrium if no player is interested in changing their quantity while the rival continues doing what they're doing, right? So no one has a profitable unilateral deviation. No one wants to switch alone. If that's true, then we've got an equilibrium. And so these optimal choices give us our strategy profile. Given our analysis, this, this strategy profile is an equilibrium, sometimes called the Cournot-Nash equilibrium, right? John Nash introduced the concept of Nash equilibrium in, uh, let's see, 1950, I think, or is it 50? So it's 1950, it's his PhD thesis, I think at the age of 22. So it's either, he was 20, nope, he, is, he was, yeah, so it was 1950 at the age of 22 was the, uh, was the Nash equilibrium, although Cournot and Bertrand kind of anticipated it a little bit. With this, uh, with this game form. Anyway, so uh, mathematically, if it's a definition of a Nash equilibrium, now if you study Nash equilibrium, cool, we've got that. If not, if, you know, for just my, like my standard intermediate micro, I like showing you this and then coming back to it much later on. So for now, uh, all this is saying is we have an equilibrium if my profit from choosing Q1 star is higher than my profit for choosing any other choice while my rival keeps playing Q2 star, right? And if that's true for both players, if firm two is better off choosing Q2 star than any other Q2, while, Q, while player one keeps choosing Q1 star, then we've got a stable point. So actually this follows from a contraction mapping theorem. Um, anyway, so uh, let's see. So a, a fixed point theorem. So, Cornell uh, duopoly, numerical example. So here's the part where I'll walk through numerically and show what's happened. So here's a Cornell duopoly with two identical firms. We'll assume marginal cost is equal to three. Here's my market demand. Yeah, so I, what I did is I took the market demand from before. I made A equal to 24. I made B equal to one, D equal to one. Oh, wait a second. Having looked at this and given a marginal cost of three, you should know what our Cornell equilibrium is gonna be, right? It's gonna be 24 minus three divided by three. 24 minus three, 21 divided by three, seven. All right, so we will look for this equilibrium. 24 minus three, 21 divided by, uh, divided by three, seven. All right, so, but anyway, let's see how we can solve for this numer or do, doing the Cournot oligopoly. So here's my profit function. Uh, here's my profit function for firm two. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write out and I'm saying we recognize this problem is symmetric. We can just solve for firm one's reaction curve. It'll be the same for firm two. It's symmetric because, sorry, both have the same coefficient on their quantity choice, one, in the inverse demand, and both have two identical firms, both have the same marginal cost. So we have symmetry. All right, so that means that firm one and firm two's reaction curves are going to look the same, right? So here I've, I've distributed Q1, taken a derivative, solve for Q1. Here's firm one's reaction as a function of firm two's choice. Here's firm two's choice, a reaction as a function of firm one's choice. Now we'll solve a system of equations, two equations and two unknowns, and look, these are symmetric, they're the same. Has to be that way because they had the same coefficients on their quantity choices, and they had the same marginal cost. All right, so here's solving 
right? Here's solving the system of reaction curves. I'm just plugging, I'm substituting for Q2 in firm one's reaction, right? Substitute for, for Q2, substitute this in here. That's this, whoops, not, not all that, just this first line. And then just the algebra to solve, look again, one, two, four, three, right? And so as you're solving, your right-hand side is gonna go Q, two, four, three. And if it doesn't, you've done something wrong. Like if you go up to five, you've done something wrong. It's gonna go four, and then it's gonna go, how's it get down to three? Well, this is gonna be a minus, a minus, so that's a, so that's a plus, but then moving to the other side, it's a minus. Okay, so 21 divided by three tells us my optimal selection for firm one is seven. We knew that already. My optimal selection for firm two, seven. Okay, so that's there's our Corno equilibrium. Now curves and we can take a look at the firm's uh, reaction curves and so here I've got q2 on the vertical axis q1 on the horizontal axis the equilibrium is where these reaction curves cross so firm one's reaction curve let's see firm one's reaction curve starts at it has a has a intercept of 21 over 2 matter of fact when does that happen if q2 is 0 firm one has a monopoly right so then firm one's choice q of q1 of 0 is going to be 21 over 2. So firm 1's optimal choice, if firm 2 sets 0, is right here. So here's firm 1's monopoly outcome, if firm 2 sets a quantity of 0. And here's firm 2's monopoly outcome, if firm 1 sets a quantity of 0, right? Here's Q1. If Q1 is 0, then we're here. Then Q2 is 21 over 2. Because by symmetry, if Q2, Q1 is 0, right? Q1 of Q2, or Q, Q2 of Q1 is 0, then firm two is a monopoly, and that firm two's monopoly choice is just gonna be 21 over two, so 10.5, right? Okay. So our core no equilibrium is given by the strategy profile. Strategy profile just takes one strategy from each player. To find the price at which the firms can sell, we go back to the inverse demand. The inverse demand was 21 minus Q1 minus Q2. So 21 minus seven minus seven, or, or sorry, 24 minus seven minus seven. So 24 minus 14 is 10. So our, our Corneau price is gonna be 10. Our profits are gonna be 10 times seven minus seven times three. This is price times quantity minus quantity times cost. I should have written this the other way. So this is price times quantity minus quantity times cost. Yeah, so 49. Total producer surplus, joint producer surplus, summing up from one and from two's producer surplus is 98. Now let's look back at the monopoly outcome. That'll make more sense when we come back to this. Let's look at the monopoly outcome. So the inverse demand was 24 minus uh, Q. And you're like, wait a second, no, it was 24 minus Q1 minus Q2. No, well, Q1 plus Q2 is takes us the quantity from firm one plus the quantity from firm two, that's our total market quantity. So if there's only one firm serving the market, then the demand is the market demand. It's served by our monopolist. So our monopoly faces demand 24 minus Q. Marginal cost is three. So here is maximizing profit, price times quantity minus cost times quantity. And then here I've just done all this algebra immediately. It's gonna be 24 Q minus three is 21 Q minus Q squared. Taking our derivative, it's gonna be 21 minus two Q. Uh, and then solving for optimal quantity, our monopoly quantity is gonna be 21 over two. We knew that already from back here, because I told, it, told you it was. Now we've got our monopoly quantity, we can find our monopoly price. Let's plug 21 over two into my inverse demand and solve. So we'll have 24 minus 21 over two. And this gives me, this gives me my monopoly price. Monopoly price is 27 over two. Our monopoly profit or producer surplus is gonna be 27 over two minus three times 21 over two is equal 110.25. And you're like, whoa, wait a second. <laughs> what do you just do? Well, this is price, 27 over two. This is cost. Price minus cost, and then this is quantity. Price minus cost times quantity. That's our, that's our formula for profit, right? If you don't believe me, we'll just distribute this. So price, 27 over two times quantity, 21 over two minus cost three times 21 over two. Sure enough, price times quantity minus cost times quantity. That's all this is. I've just kind of factored out the, the quantity, right? So this is gonna be my monopoly profit. Compare that to our Corneau, our joint Corneau profits, which was 98, right? Okay, so let's compare the Corneau duopoly and monopoly outcomes to the competitive outcome. With a competitive outcome, we'd set price equal to marginal cost. 
So the competitive market, here's price, right? Inverse demand set equal to marginal cost. 21 is equal to our competitive quantities joint, uh, our, our competitive market's joint quantity. That's this right here. Here's our competitive, here's our competitive quantity, the 21, right? So now you kind of see why we did this picture like this, right? Corneau duopoly, monopoly, competitive market. Okay, so profit in the competitive market, zero. Price minus marginal cost is zero. Times 21 quantity is a profits of zero. No producer surplus in the competitive market. And we can see this comparison. Here's the quantity for the Corneau. It's gonna be 23 divided by three, or 21 divided by three, which is seven per firm. Our monopoly is gonna produce 10.5 per firm or 21 over two. And our competitive market is gonna jointly produce 21 units. The Corneau price is 10, the monopoly price is 13.5, uh, 13 and the competitive, and the competitive uh, quantity, or competitive price is going to be 3. Right. So producer surplus for the Corneau is going to be, is going to be summing up what we have from the two duopolists, so that's 98. Uh, producer surplus for the monopoly, that was 110.25, and producer surplus for the competitive market was 0. It turns out if you add more firms to the Corneau model, it ends up approaching competition, right? So in the limit, as you add, as, as the number of firms is like the N firm Corneau oligopoly ends up approaching perfect competition. Here's a picture of surplus. So this is the monopoly outcome, monopoly vertical intercept, monopoly horizontal intercept. Here's the marginal cost. I, I didn't draw in where would be the monopoly's marginal revenue, but marginal revenue to cross marginal cost, right? right here. So here's my monopoly quantity. Here's the price. Producer surplus is just this rectangle. Consumer surplus would be right here. This would be deadweight loss. With the duopoly, here's deadweight loss. Here's consumer surplus. Here's, this was like, price is like right out here. Uh, quantity was like right out here. Price is like right out here. And what is this? 14. That's the joint uh, that was the joint quantity, not the individual quantity. The individuals produced quantities of seven. Jointly, we had a quantity of 14. We had a price of uh, price of 10. So this is at the market level, not at the firm level. The market level producer surplus is 98. All right, and then with perfect competition, the quantity we get was 21. The cost had been three. Consumer surplus is the whole area. This would maximize, this would maximize efficiency. This would be the most efficient outcome. The last thing, and I don't know, this is kind of interesting getting into the theory part of it. Uh, so for the for the type of exam that I would write, I, I wouldn't be super, I, I wouldn't be too worried about, I mean, try to follow the logic, but um, I think this is more, this is more useful for actually how we think about Corneau relative to Bertrand. So in Corneau, we say the firm strategies are strategic substitutes, which means the marginal payoff of the firm's action is decreasing in the action of their rival. The marginal payoff of the firm's action is decreasing the firm's rival. So in terms of my payoffs, I prefer when your quantity is lower, right? So as I, as I increase my output, my marginal payoff is falling, the higher is the action you've chosen, the higher is the quantity you've chosen. Also, there's a negative externality between the firms. When choosing their output, each firm is taking into account the adverse effect of the lower market price on their own output rather than the aggregate output, right? So I'm caring about what's happening in my own profits. It, I en end up actually kind of ruining the market price for everybody else. Each firm ends up picking an output that's going to be too large relative to the optimal from the industry's point of view. As a whole, producers would prefer something closer to monopoly. And then my comment from before, it turns out as the number of firms increases, the Corneau solution approaches the competitive outcome. Right? And then from Varian, this is just relating ISO profits and reaction curves. Uh, I don't, I've don't. i got this in here. I mean for us to refer back to it a little bit later because here I've talked about Stackelberg, which is corresponding to the monopoly quantity. Uh, Ys, remember Varian uses Y for output. Here's a reaction curve for firm two, reaction curve for firm one. They cross at their equilibrium. And then here we've got ISO profit lines, right? All, all corresponding to the same, uh, to, to the same levels of, same levels of profit. And uh, let's, let's see, these are the ISO profit. Yeah, ISO profit for firm, uh, for firm one, from the perspective of firm one. And let's see, well, I, to be able to say much more about this, we have to talk about Stackelberg because, um, so I, I actually, I don't know if maybe I'll, 
I hate edit. I don't. I've never edited. I, I don't know. So, so, so uh, Stackelberg has a leader follower structure. It matters which one you stipulate as firm one and firm two. Typically, Stackelberg firm number one is your Stackelberg leader, and firm number two would be your Stackelberg follower. Your Stackelberg leader would have a higher profit level than your Stackelberg follower, um, and so. Uh, and it would actually prefer, Stackelberg leader actually prefers Stackelberg to Corneau. Stackelberg follower would prefer Corneau, but of course the leader makes the, makes the choice. And let's see, here's the ISO profit lines for firm two. And let's see, here's a reaction curve and I'll put a firm two. So this must be, boy, I have to remember what Varian was doing here. So, um, all right. Yeah, I don't know. So here I've kind of screwed up this video. <laughs> it's late. Chasing a puppy all day. Um, all right, so if you were, so here's a couple exercises. I don't know. If you're a firm competing in quantity versus rival firms, do you prefer your rivals choose a higher or lower quantity? Choosing in quantity, this is Corneau. Yeah, you prefer your rivals choose a lower quantity. Is Corneau a game of strategic substitutes, strategic complements? Corneau strategic substitutes. It turns out Bertrand is actually strategic complements. How many Corneau firms are required to sustain the Corneau Nash equilibrium? Two. You had two firms for the Corneau equilibrium. Uh, if you had one firm, you just have a monopoly. If you had more firms, you could also have a you could also have a Corneau equilibrium, but you need at least two firms for your Corneau equilibrium. Um, all right. Hope you enjoyed the video. Go ahead and sign off here now. Uh, stay safe. Stay healthy, everyone. And then I'll link up some uh, numerical examples that'll be useful in further illustrating Cornell.